Let us pray. Lord God, let the words of our mouths bring you praise. May the words that we speak be seasoned with love and grace. May the things, O Lord, that we choose to say and do bring glory and not shame to your name this day. Amen. A number of years ago, I was doing some research on the internet. I don't know if that's, it sounds better if I say it that way. I was doing research for a sermon. And I came across this website or an article within a website. And it had in there, the article was 50 of the most beautiful sentences in literature. Me being the literary genius and scholar that I am, I thought I would check it out. And I found this sentence. So I wrote it down. And I put it under my desk, the glass on my desk, and I look at it occasionally. And this past week, I was at a church meeting. And we were discussing something. And this sentence came to mind. And as I was preparing this sermon, this sentence came to mind. This is the sentence is from W. H. Auden, and it's from a poem entitled "The More Loving One." And here's the sentence: "If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me." As a follower of Christ, as a As someone who wants to do the right thing, that is some pretty good words to follow, don't you think? I think so. Over 30 years ago, I was voracious in my appetite for becoming more and more like Christ and studying and the Word. And I had a a good Presbyterian friend, it was predestined that we get together and, and do some study. And he gave me a, he pointed me to a study by Dr. R.C. Sproul, who is a Presbyterian seminary professor. It's called The Holiness of God. And in it are the series of lectures and a book that went with it. And I ate it up. It was a great study. One of, the, one of those studies in, within it, one of the sessions is on the holiness of Christ. And the truth is, I remember it, since I didn't go and listen to it yesterday, is that he makes this statement. Think of the most holy, the most sanctified, the greatest Christian you've ever met or known. Get their picture in your head. Think about it. And at that time, I thought Mother Teresa, she's a pretty good one. I thought about Billy Graham. I thought about some people who had been very instrumental in my own life and, and my coming to know Jesus and growing in my faith. And I thought, yeah, those people. And then Dr. Sproul uses this. He says, ever who you're thinking about, and if you think it's you, just know this. You are closer, or they are closer, to being more like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin than they are being like Christ. Because Christ and God are uniquely other and holy. Unimaginably holy. Made me take a step back, because if those folks don't have a chance to being like Jesus. I certainly don't. So when we start talking about what God wants of us and how so much other God loves us, it's hard to imagine. It really is truly hard to imagine. But Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 reads this way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Other, holy, 
uncommon. The first chapter of the Gospel of John, for the most part, is a prologue, and it tells you everything that's going to be in that Gospel. If you want to know what's in it, read the first chapter. And you get to verse 11 of the first chapter. It says this about Jesus. He went unto his own, and his own received him not. He went to his own people. They thought they knew who he was. And they didn't receive him. What they were looking for was not who Jesus is. You look at the Gospel of Luke and we see something similar but a little different. It's called a frontispiece in chapter 4. Jesus, by this time, he's been born. He, he's been to the temple at 12. All those things. He's been baptized by John. He's been into the desert. And he decides to go home to Nazareth. And he goes to the synagogue, as was his custom. And you see a Reader's Digest version of what goes on in the, temp uh, in the synagogue that day. Because it's usually about a two to three hour event in that day. There's reading the scripture, there's singing, there's sorts of, all sorts of things. And if you're the one reading the scripture, you will then interpret it. And Jesus gets up to speak and he reads from Isaiah. And then someone recognizes that he's Joseph's son. He's Mary's son. They didn't accept him. Some people would not have expect, ex, accepted him because he, they did not know him. They didn't accept him because they did know him. Because he's just Joseph's son. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In that day, it, you didn't rise above your, the way you were born. You, didn't, you, you were lucky if you stayed where you were born. It's that thing about the apple doesn't fall from the tree. You're lucky if the apple falls off the tree. And so they didn't accept him. And his, God, his ministry begins, and he begins to have a ministry to the crowds, and he heals people, and miracles are done. He finds his way to Caesarea Philippi. He finds his way to the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and in the ninth chapter, the 51st verse, we read the words that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And his message changes from the crowds to discipleship. We begin hearing these parables about the kingdom of God. Things that we think we should know since we've been raised on the parables of Jesus. If we think we know what the kingdom of God is like, we might need to think again. Parables for many years, scholars said there is one thought, one meaning to it. And if you don't get it, you missed it because it's only one thing. Luckily, I went through seminary where they said it was something else. They said a parable, you need to think of it like an onion, that it has many layers that you can peel back and peel back. My New Testament professor said, it's like looking in a kaleidoscope. You have all the colors. You see something and you see a shape and you can turn one of the cylinders and all of a sudden the shape changes, the color's still there, and you see something totally different. Think of parables that way. And so in the 10th chapter, we start off with a parable. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. A man's going down from Jer Je uh, Jerusalem to Damascus, and he, on his way, he falls among thieves. They strip him of his clothes because that was the most valuable thing that most people had was their, their the clothes. And, and you could tell somebody's wealth by the clothes they wore. Well, they leave this man naked by the side of the road. And, of course, the person you would think, the child of the light, the priest shows up. Remember that? The priest sees this naked man and says, I don't know if he's a Jew or a Gentile. If I touch him and he's a Gentile, I won't be clean. I can't do my work at the temple. Oh, I got to meet in the church anyway. And he leaves the man. That who we thought were children of the light were not children of the light, were they? 
Then a Levite comes by and I'll walk on the side of the road too. And then there comes the Samaritan. The one who is a half-breed, the one that is not supposed to, the one that everybody despises, those who are prejudiced against him, that all the wrong things and will never do the right thing. God forbid they do the right thing. This person who is laying on the ground has value to somebody of the world and not someone of the light. Makes you wonder who's in the right and who's in the wrong, who's on the inside, who's on the outside. The kingdom is God, of God looks different than we think. We then have a parable of the rich fool, a parable of the being watchful, a parable of the fig tree that does not produce figs. We have the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast and the narrow door and the parable of the banquet. We get to Luke 15. We talked about that last week where we have a lost sheep and no economist, no businessman in the world is going to take a chance on losing 99 sheep because of one sheep that's gone astray. But in the economy of God, you do. The one who's lost is an infinite value. And you risk the 99 for the one. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. And then, God forbid, the next parable, which is about a lost coin, it gets humorous. Think about losing a dime in your house. It'll show up one day, I don't care. My wife will find it when she vacuums, maybe. She'll hear it rattling around and she'll dig it out. That's not what the widow did, is it? She looks all through the house. Then she takes everything out of the house and puts it out in the yard and sweeps it till she finds it. That's how much value is in something that has, in our standard, has no value. And then there's the lost son who basically tells her father, I wish you were dead. Give me what, what I deserve because I know I can manage this money better than you because you've done it wrong all your life. And the father does the unthinkable. Many of us would say, why don't you just go on? You don't want to be around here? Take off. Manage it yourself. A little tough love. Never hurt anybody. Right? Somebody shake your head. Well, you might say, well, that's what my dad told me. And yet, while this son, who wished he was dead, is still a long way off, the father runs to him. The kingdom of God is so different, isn't it, than the values that we have. It's easy for us to think of us as children of the light, because we thought the priest would have been a child of the light. We thought the Levite should be a child of the light. We thought all those people would be ch children of the light. And yet, they still don't love the way Jesus loves. Still don't love that way. And so we get to chapter 16. And if you didn't think some of those parables made sense, this one certainly doesn't. Does it? I'll be honest with you. I really don't think Jesus is telling us all to go steal. And yet we read, many of us would think, well, you know, that manager, the, the owner of that, that farm, that vineyard, whatever it was, you know he, he, he stole from his employees. So whatever that manager decided to do against the owner, that's, he's justified, right? We have people who say that today. Yeah, steal whatever you can because they are being cruel. They, are, they don't deserve what they get paid either. Have we heard that before? We hear that and, and we, you're right. They don't deserve that. 
They deserve to be stolen from. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. And so the man who's caught in his evil ways, he's trying to figure out, okay, I've been caught, I've been a bad manager I, I, or a bad steward, I need to go do something. And, and since I don't want to dig, I don't want to dig, and I can't, I will, I will figure out something, I will use my gumption, my intellect, my resourcefulness, I will do what my friend has done in the past, I will, I will figure out how to save myself. So that when I don't, when I have to make a, come to accounting, I will still be okay. And so he does. And he is commended for what he did. The owner commends him. And we think, wow, that's amazing. But it's not being commended for what we think he's commending him for. It's commending him because he took initiative to do something. You see, it's not just enough to be loving. It's not just enough to come to church. It's not just enough to pray. It's, it's, it means that we got to use the resources that we've been gifted individually. Use our gifts and graces to make a difference, to be resourceful to enough to make a difference in the world. It's one thing to say, I've never done anything to anybody. Well, I really hadn't done anything at all. And Jesus is calling us. If we're going to be agents of the kingdom of God, we have to be active. In Matthew 16, we hear up at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked, who do they say that I am? And they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some of the other prophets. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says to Peter, true words that have never been spoken. And upon this truth, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Right? Right? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, the kingdom of God is a, a being that will blow the doors off the gates of hell. We need to be resourceful. We need to use the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be active in our obedience so that people can actually see us do what we're supposed to be doing. It's different. There's a story about a man who was in the hospital and he had that tray cart thing over his desk, uh, over the bed. You know, all of us have had one of those at one point and you had the little cup of water there and, and it was about empty but somehow or another he was, hit it and water hit the floor. Now he's scared because he was He's afraid he's going to fall if he gets out of the bed. So he rings the buzzer and a nurse uh, walks in and he says, I spilt that water there. I'm afraid if I get up and go to the bathroom, can you wipe that up? Well, there was a rule at the hospital that nurses and nurses aides, they could clean up small spills. But if it was a large spill, they would call housekeeping. She looked at it, the nurse, and she called housekeeping. And the housekeeping came in and said, that's not a big spill. That's a little spill. That's your job. And the nurse said, that is a big spill. You clean it up. And they get in an argument with the man who's in the bed who just doesn't want to fall. They're right there in the middle of it. So the man takes the container of water and pours it on the floor. <laughs> and he said, is it big enough now? <laughs> you see, sometimes we are like that. We're having an argument about whose job is it to do, to be 
the kingdom of God and breaking into someone's life. And we just say, well, that's really the preacher's job. No, it's that job. You said you would do that. You said you're a witness. It would support the church with your witness. No, no, no. And, and while we're doing this, there was a man laying on the side of the road about to die. There's somebody who's lost that won't be found. There's a lost sheep. There's a lost coin. There's a lost son. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. May that be ours. May that be our mantra. May that be our battle cry. Love is not a noun, it's a verb. And that's what Christ is calling us to do. Using all our gifts, all our graces, to do extravagant, unbelievable things for his glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your extravagant love that you would search the world over to find each of us. And you would never give up looking for us. May we have such passion, such love for you and love for our neighbor that we would be willing to do that too. And never argue about whose job it is. But just do it. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.